Good, or, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here and for joining us for this uh, Smart City Governance uh, session. Uh, my name is Valentina Pavel. I'm uh, a digital rights advocate and a Mozilla Fellow currently working with uh, Privacy International. And uh, together with us, um, we have um, William Webster uh, at the University, University of Stirling. Um, he's a professor of public policy and management at the Stirling Management School. Uh, he's also the director of uh, CRISP, the Center for Research into Information Surveillance and Privacy. Uh, alongside, we have uh, Mirko Schaeffer uh, from the Utrecht University. Uh, he's a project lead of the Utrecht Data School. Uh, next, we have uh, Max von Grafenstein from the University of the Arts uh, Berlin. Um, he's a professor for digital self-determination self at the Berlin Career College um, at the University of Arts in, Ber in Berlin. Um, next, we have uh, Sara Deli Espositi. Um, she's a research fellow in the Institute for Goods and Public Policies. Um, and also uh, David Murakami Wood, um, professor at Queen's University in uh, Canada and a member of the Surveillance Studies Center. As moderator for today's session, we have Ola Svenius uh, from the um, uh, Stockholm University. Uh, he's a researcher at the Swedish Defense um, uh, Research Agency. And we're um, going to dig a little bit uh, of the promises that smart cities um, um, offer us in terms of uh, quality of life and uh, informed decision making and um, um, better participation for, for citizens, but also look at the privacy implications and the data pr protection concerns. Um, because it's quite obvious that smart cities do not really stop on the streets. Uh, for example, we have smart meters we'll, we'll, which will monitor our energy consumption, which will know like what time we get out of bed, uh, when we do our shower, when we go to work. Um, and this um, um, smart city may become a um, uh, high-tech panopticon if, uh, if, we not, we, if we do not address uh, the data protection concerns and data collections uh, management in due time. So I invite uh, our moderator, Ola, to um, start up the discussion and please feel free to intervene at any point in the discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, I think due for, for the, the uh, uh, we're going to go further with the presentations right away so that we don't, so we have a bit of time at the end for public debate and questions and everything. So if you have questions, um, please write them down and we can take them afterwards. Um, so I will start with William. Do you want to stand here or do you want to? No, I'll come up. Okay. <coughs> Yeah. I can't see the there's a little icon. Okay, good morning everyone. Um, I'm not going to talk for very long. I'm going to pr try and provide as much space as possible for our other four speakers. It's quite a congested panel, this one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to provide a little bit of context. Um, so as uh, Director of CRISP, uh, we sponsored this particular panel and we were involved in organising the topic area and the speakers. So I'm going to provide a bit of context of what we were trying to drive at when we uh, started a panel around smart governance in smart cities and uh, public services and privacy, etc. So uh, my name is Professor William Webster. I'm a director of CRISP. CRISP is a research centre based in the UK. It's a, it's a collaboration between four universities, University of Stirling, University of Edinburgh, University of St Andrews, University of Essex. And we're the only university, only research centre which has this real strong focus on the impacts and consequences of surveillance in societies. The only research centre in the UK with that, that unique focus. We have about 40 researchers looking at lots of different things from uh, smart cities through to um, surveillance and democracy and a number of different research projects. So our 
URL is there, our Twitter feed is there, so you can find out much more about us there. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is, for just a few minutes, is a project called SmartGov. This is a project that I'm leading at Stirling, and it's looking very much at smart governance arrangements that are emerging around some smart cities. So I'm just going to describe the piece of research that we're doing and provide a bit of context for the speakers that are going to follow. I'm using someone else's laptop, so oh, there we go. Okay, so we have this uh, project, which is uh, an international partnership between three universities in, fr in, three different co in three different countries and three different practitioner partners. So it's a collaboration between FGV in Brazil, University of Stirling in Scotland, and Utrecht University in the Netherlands, and we're working with three um, contemporary smart cities, uh, Curitiba in Brazil, Glasgow in Scotland, and Utrecht. All three cities have won awards, around their smart cities developments um, and are heralded as internationally worthwhile case studies for different aspects of their smart city projects. Oops, that's the one wrong way. Okay, so it's a four year project, we're coming to a close now. So we're starting to uh, pick out some of our core findings. Most of the empirical work is done. It's funded primarily through academic research councils. So it's an academic project. It has a strong practitioner focus. The practitioners are heavily involved in the, the research design and research implementation, with the idea being that our findings have some practical value as the project develops. Okay, so the key objective of SmartGov is to think about how you can have sustainable urban development in cities when the drivers for modern resilient societies are increasingly <coughs> oriented towards new technology. So how do we understand the emergence of governance arrangements in city environments? Um, what we're particularly interested in is the way that new technologies are used to engage citizens in the governance of those sustainable cities. So I'll, that's an important point, the engagement of citizens. I'll come back to that in a moment. But we're also interested in the roles played by smart technologies in fostering the co-production of services, the development of new urban infrastructure and governance arrangements. So it's an unusual smart cities project in that we're very focused on governance structures and arrangements as opposed to service delivery. Okay, so what we've done in this project is we've been very critical of traditional smart cities approaches which focus very much on the way that new technologies can be used to provide enhanced public services, um, e-government if you like. And the traditional approach is that you can harness new technology, you can make the services more efficient and therefore you can save money and the city can be more sustainable. What we're interested here in this project is how those very same technologies can be utilised to engage citizens. And that engagement can lead to service redesign, it can lead to new public policy initiatives. So we're looking very much at the different mechanisms that might utilise new technology that allow citizens to be involved in the governance of their cities. And what we're particularly interested in is the contextual factors and forces that shape that technological development. So the social technological ingredients that make those government, governance arrangements successful or otherwise. And we're able to compare that in the three cities we're looking at, where there are three different, very different histories and trajectories around governance mechanisms and technology development. Okay, so we're very much interested in citizen engagement, co-production and governance. Okay, so the context for this panel, I said I was going to be brief, so the context for this panel that's merging from this piece of research is that um, these technologies that we often refer to as smart technology, or digital technologies, um, can be used to engage citizens as well as deliver e-government services. Now, there's lots of different mechanisms by which citizens can be engaged and their roles can be quite different. So the citizen can be engaged as a simple consumer of a service, but they can be a facilitator of a service, they can be a designer of a service, and there's lots of different ways that that can be achieved. It could be through social media, it could be through living labs, some of the things that we're going to come on and talk about in a moment. At the heart of the smart city agenda is the processing of huge amounts of personal data. That's, that's a given. Um, and citizens now, through their engagement through these new technologies and governance practices, are also providing different sorts of data, not just consumption data, not just administrative service use data, but data about their uh, preferences, data about um, all sorts of aspects of their personal lives. Um, and that raises a number of data protection and privacy issues that are going to be discussed on this panel. Um, and what we've seen in the three cities that we've studied is that three different approaches to managing data protection and managing pri privacy. Um, often in the smart city environment, the push is to try these new technologies in a kind of very experimental way. 
and in some instances privacy concerns are secondary so um, that's coming through very clearly in our research that might be some of the issues that our, the other speakers will raise so <coughs> context is important um, and context very much shapes the way that services evolve the way that governance evolves as well and the way that privacy is handled and that I think is the background for this particular panel so I'm going to move on to the next speaker um, and what we see is through the speakers the idea behind this panel is that we're going to talk about data ethics we're going to talk about public participation we're going to talk about privacy concerns all in this the context of the smart city and the context is often a series of institutions um, at a very local level um, so I'm going to pass on now to the next speaker, who is going to be... Sorry? It's on the, it's on the list, yeah. So this is the second. So I'm here. I can start if you want. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Mirko Tobias Schäfer. I'm an associate professor at Utrecht University and I run a research group called Utrecht Data School and Data Fight Society. What we do is we investigate the impact of datafication on our understanding of citizenship and democracy. Uh, we do that by uh, carrying out research projects for municipalities or ministries, for instance, applied research projects, as this example at the city of Gouda, where our students investigated environmental data to find more explanations for <coughs> residential burglaries. And we use a sort of participatory observation uh, using our own tool, the Data Ethics Decision Aid, where we help organizations to think critically through their data projects in terms of ethics, what kind of values are violated, to what extent are values of the organizations implemented. And while we help these organizations to rethink their data projects, it gives us tremendous valuable insight into the operational capacities of an organization, the data projects they are developing, the awareness for data ethics, uh, the data projects they are planning, uh, the various actors within the organizations that are either pushing or slowing down an agenda revolving around datafication and digitization. So this is where the evidence for, for our research uh, mostly comes from. Um, in the Netherlands, we have, uh, under the labels of either smart cities of data uh, or data-driven management, mostly explorative projects that are developed. So there's not a concerted effort within the Netherlands or uh, a larger platform where cities can share their experiences. We speak very often about very explorative projects. And uh, why are the Netherlands an interesting case? Because the process of decentralization pushes municipalities to look to data practices in order to fulfill their tasks. Uh, the process of decentralization describes the delegation of crucial tasks from the national government to the, to the local governments. For instance, everything in the social domain, from unemployment over uh, social welfare for children, elderly, is now placed in the hands of the municipalities. The municipalities hope that using data techniques helps them to distribute their funds in an even and just way. Um, much of that, specifically for the Netherlands, can be found in the Behrensrot report. Unfortunately, it's in Dutch, but this is a first overview of all the data-driven management initiatives in the Netherlands. So here's an example of what municipalities are experimenting with in the Netherlands. All these, uh, um, the entire list are actual, actual projects, data projects that have been carried out, uh, have been terminated or are actually well implemented. For instance, the predicting early school leavers uh, uh, algorithm is used in two municipalities to define a risk population of uh, pupils that might leave school early. Uh, very, very popular uh, at uh, municipalities at the moment are attempts to predict uh, who will when request which kind of social services in order to um, develop preemptive measures and um, the, process, uh, the, the project predicting domestic violence was one that uh, was doomed because it was too personally invasive to gather the data and 
uh, was not uh, uh, further developed. Mapping loitering youth, uh, a project that uh, made, uh, made national news in the Netherlands because they used Facebook data uh, of teenagers to find out where they, where they hang out, who, who's befriended with whom, and develop social network analysis to trace uh, them. So many of these data projects, as you've just seen, are inherently um, causing, uh, raising issues about privacy, but also other things. If, and, and I want to talk about the other things as well. Um, uh, the inherently political quality of data projects. And just look at one example, for instance, smart streetlights. Two municipalities in the Netherlands are really far in the process of procuring uh, new uh, streetlight systems, and those are smart streetlight systems. Uh, a smart street light is not only smart because it saves energy, it runs on LED, but it's also a data platform. It can collect data. But the question then that occurs is who decides what kind of data will be collected? Who has access to the data? Is the municipality the owner of the data? Have the residents a say in what with the data will happen? Can entrepreneurs use the data for developing smart services and if so can they reproduce their services in other cities which forces municipalities not only to think locally but also to connect to other cities and develop uh, national wide uh, policies how to handle these issues also maybe to cooperate in dealing with larger platforms and large providers of these systems to uh, leverage their own negotiating power so Data projects are or can be inherently political. That affects much more than just issues of privacy. And if you look at the participants in our workshops, we see that the so-called street-level bureaucrats are very well aware of the fact that they are not busy with, with merely administrative tasks, but actually with political labor without having a mandate for it. And that is the reason why they turn to finding regulations, ethical guidelines, uh, finding ways of developing data projects that are not politically tinted. And that's really difficult. Think of a data project about poverty prediction that will be very different in a municipality that is run by a liberal council than in a municipality that is run by a social democratic council. So data practices must become matters of public interest, in effect, in a way. And why? Are values coming here uh, in, in, into the equation because of the discretionary powers that the various municipalities have. They can execute policies in different ways. The values in one city do not equal the values that are emphasized in any other city. And that is also why uh, off-the-shelf smart city solutions are uh, quite, quite flawed from, from the beginning. And values can be used here to reflect on the actions that are implemented in data projects. That was actually what I had to say today, and I hope we can have a discussion on to what extent we can implement uh, critical thinking about data and data practices in a way that does not only forces us to, uh, to legalize the processes furthermore, but to allow street-level bureaucrats, municipal uh, uh, employees, councilmen and women, to think critically about the political implications of their data projects and have an electorate that makes a decision which party is actually the most convenient, most interesting one in representing the public values in their own agenda. Thank you very much. my timer. Uh, so thank you very much for um, yeah, uh, inviting me as a speaker to this panel. Um, I think um, my presentation uh, perfectly builds up in your presentation, or um, uh, at least it fits together. So um, that you not wonder, I'm uh, on the one hand um, a professor at the Berlin-based Einstein Center Digital Future, appointed at the University of the Arts. However, I'm a trained lawyer. 
And on the other side, um, on the other hand, I'm also a um, co-head of the research program, the governance of data-driven innovation and cybersecurity at the also Berlin-based um, Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. So, and the, um, the research uh, project I um, run there for the last, uh, yeah, uh, let's say one to two years actually. This was at this institute. So, um, uh, do not wonder about the uh, different names, etc. So. Um, just to give you a brief overview of what this project actually was about, um, uh, the, um, the idea was that the city of Berlin came up and said, hey, um, why shouldn't we build up a huge smart city infrastructure um, by um, uh, collecting data through different um, uh, data sources and uh, make this accessible to everybody who's interested um, um, in the data in a non-discriminatory uh, way. So um, academics, um, journalists, uh, big companies, the state, um, uh, uh, small innovative uh, startups, etc. And of course, the big question was, okay, can this actually be set up in a data protection compliant way? A very challenging and uh, tricky question, in uh, my opinion. Um, and this becomes maybe more clear if I show you um, at least the three major um, uh, uh, data sources. So um, what the city wanted to do in the beginning, and everything started with a very small, purely technological um, uh, research project um, at a Berlin uh, roundabout. And there they set up um, a public Wi-Fi um, system um, where they collected MAC addresses and of course um, a time and location stamps of, uh, yeah, of the persons uh, carrying uh, uh, around their mobile phones, etc. Then we had uh, C CCTV cameras um, uh, recording uh, moving objects, uh, be it vehicles or uh, 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 pedestrians. And then we had um, also um, a parking lot sensors who just um, uh, uh, tried to find out whether there were standing uh, uh, objects uh, uh, on certain locations. So for example, uh, uh, parking lots. And um, then, because it was just a hypothetical um, uh, yeah, uh, project, uh, we had to define use cases. And of course, the, mayor, uh, the major use case was, okay, we, we, uh, we would like to do research with the data, so uh, better urban planning, better traffic management, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so far, we didn't see this very problematic because at least yeah, there is just an abstract risk yeah, that this data might be misused, a very high abstract risk, but at least at this stage, the data is not yet uh, used against uh, the, the citizens. Yeah? So I don't think that I, I, I think this is not tricky enough, but uh, nevertheless. To, um, to make this a little bit more specific, we also defined then, of course, um, other use cases um, where the data might be uh, used against um, uh, citizens, for example, not really against uh, them is um, a, a mobile app where you have clearly, uh, clearly a reference um, uh, to the user um, of this app. So uh, the user can uh, use this app in order to find free parking lots, reserve this parking lot, and even pay the parking lot afterwards. This is, uh, uh, by the way, already existing technology, yeah? not in Berlin, but uh, in other cities. And then the third use case was, of course, um, okay, why uh, uh, actually it's not so improbable that um, a public agency comes to the idea, gets the idea, hey, why shouldn't we use all the data um, for um, automated um, law, uh, traffic law enforcement? And actually this wasn't so far away. So for example, um, they, uh, e even the, te te uh, the techies had already uh, some ideas like, um, okay, why uh, um, couldn't we find um, automatically cars moving uh, um, um, uh, with more uh, uh, over uh, 30 kilometers uh, per, per hour? Or why not um, automatically find uh, through um, target, uh, targeting the MAC addresses and um, names, etc., if they uh, cross, um, if a ped pedestrian crosses uh, the red light? Yeah, in Germany, a big thing. Um, then, uh, or yet another use case where you hadn't even a, um, a direct connection uh, to the car. So because um, uh, the police could actually map, just, uh, just map the, the, um, the data gathered through the um, uh, 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 parking lot sensors and map this with um, zones where uh, parking is forbidden. And in the moment they see, hey, a, par um, a car is parking there, then the police could go there and then make the reference. And th this shows that even if the data collected per se um, seems to be not personal or even anonymous or whatever, the main research result uh, after we defined these um, scenarios was that there is actually no data which is not personal data. 
And just to give you one other example, so if you take um, CCD, CCTV cameras, of, of course, this startup then said, hey, we anonymize, uh, anonymize all data, which means, um, okay, let's blur the faces and the um, uh, license plates, because then the faces can't be recognized and uh, it's impossible to go to the um, license plate registry, etc. However, of course, if you could um, see uh, what kind of core this was, uh, or uh, the, the, the crazy hat this woman um, uh, 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 was wearing, maybe it was still possible for friends to uh, recognize there, so the startup started to uh, blur even more out until you only saw one moving object, uh, 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 object for example, moving with uh, 30 kilometers per hour. But even and it wasn't even possible to see is this a bicyclist or is it a huge car, whatever. However, even then we had a use case in mind where it was possible to to uh, make this data um, uh, personal again. Because, so just imagine that you record um, 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 uh, a car accident, so a moving object hitting an old woman crossing the street. And you don't see who this was, the mod, uh, uh, what the object was, but you see the action, and then you find a witness, yeah, just one street uh, uh, um, um, away, and the witness didn't see the action, but it saw that there was only one moving object, it was only one car, and the witness um, uh, recognized the car. So in that moment, you have again this extra knowledge of a third person, and it's possible to completely uh, 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 re-identify the um, originally um, anonymized data. So just that you give you um, 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 uh, uh, just an um, insight how difficult it was actually to, it was impossible to anonymize the data. Uh, the only way was to completely destroy the data so that you couldn't even see what happened um, uh, on the recording and that's useless. So um, when, we, uh, um, when we discussed um, uh, so when we discussed our, our, our research uh, um, uh, uh, impetus with the data protection authorities, at least in Berlin, uh, um, they were very reluctant and with, for very good reason said, hey, this is totally crazy, we run into a surveillance city. We can't do that. So the question was, okay, is this at least on the, on the whiteboard, is it possible to set something like a structure up where it, it, it's at least worth to think about it um, uh, in more, uh, on a more detailed level? And the idea we had, so it's not, ah, okay, two minutes. So uh, that's very good. Um, so the idea uh, we had, so we just um, uh, 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 used some concepts which are already used in medical data protection uh, projects. And the idea is um, that um, we just set up or um, a data, um, so a data governance board, which sets the rules under which conditions certain stakeholders get access to what type of data, for which purposes. And um, please don't um, misunderstand this idea like that, that this data governance uh, board really owns the data or gets in contact with the data. That's not the case. It's only a board which sets the rules. And this is different, for example, to the owner of the technical infrastructure. And also, uh, so this is uh, one, made, uh, uh, one important uh, difference. And the um, other point uh, that should be um, highlighted is that the technical infrastructure shouldn't be seen uh, like a, a huge data lake, so a cloud or a server w where all this data is, is stored. No, not at all. This can be a very simple infrastructure, for example, just um, 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 a contract plate and a U USB stick, and the data governance board says, okay, tell me your purposes um, uh, uh, and tell me which, uh, which data you would like to have, and then I, I uh, set the conditions, and then you can go uh, grab your USB stick and exchange your data. Yeah. So. Uh, so uh, that's um, the basic idea and on this basis we came in fact indeed to the conclusion okay let's think about it how this works and I mean the remaining questions are then so um, who exactly uh, is this governance uh, uh, board is this uh, the state or are these private entities or are these citizens and if, uh, uh, if yes uh, how, how can we make them participate in, in, in governing um, uh, the sharing practices the next question is how does this infrastructure really look like so is this a centralized uh, uh, server or uh, is this a blockchain technology whatever but this is super decisive um, and the next question is then, of course, if we work with uh, decentralized infrastructures, um, how can we really achieve to uh, coordinate in a way that this uh, uh, is still um, feasible? And this is one, I think, of the biggest problems in the end. Yeah. Okay.
morning, Sarah. So now, <coughs> if anyone feels a bit tired or, or gloomy, just stand up and walk around a bit, and then we can sit down so we have a bit of blood flowing, like the church. Do you know where my presentation is? Yeah, it's just here on, on the... Um, uh, this, which one? So you can see it. Oh, that's top. Uh, yep. Okay. And then? Okay. Same shit works. Okay. So, and I'm moving the discussion a little bit, uh, focusing on definitions. So we, we've been talking about smart objects. We'll be talking about smart cities. When we think about smart cities, we think about smart homes, smart energy grids, smart mobility, smart healthcare. It's all part of this uh, um, intelligent cities dream that comes from the 90s. So when we talk about uh, smart, we, we're talking about a socio-technical imaginary, which is about uh, intelligent machines. Behind this imaginary, there is, uh, let's say, technology, which nowadays is called the Internet of Things. So today I want to focus a little bit about the Internet of Things, this uh, IoT, which is again a buzzword, but gives us an idea, because this is the way in which engineers uh, who are, let's say, making these dreams uh, reality, think and talk about these things. So this Internet of Things is about sensing infrastructure, it's about intelligent transport systems, remote energy management systems, wearables devices. Okay, so we are just, uh, in terms of uh, the terminology, moving into still marketing talk, but a little bit more technical. And all that to say that uh, we're actually talking about data variance, and that's why we're here. We're talking about the fact that all these sensors <coughs> are out there to collect data about the environment and uh, our bodies, our uh, expression, our feelings, okay? Collect all this information to analyze the information and take some decision, some value-added decision. So, Instead of just focusing on information privacy, I just want to take a step back and uh, uh, remind ourselves that information privacy is actually intersects with information security. And as uh, is clearly to everybody who knows the data protection laws, we're actually talking about the same things, just again using different terminology. When we talk about information security, we tend to rely on a very old paradigm that puts at the core of information security the protection of the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information. When we are a lot into the privacy community, we tend to focus a lot about confidentiality, which is a lot about data sharing, who get access to the information, but when you come from the information security side, you also focus a lot about the integrity and availability of the data. And I'm going to tell you why these uh, other two aspects, all three aspects are important, but these other two are pretty relevant when we think about the possible arms coming from information misuse. So just a quick example, these are data breaches over uh, let's say, a relatively short period of time. January 2013 until December 2018, this is the uh, amount of uh, records which have been disclosed uh, and abused. As you can see, there are, uh, they, they mostly come from uh, digital marketing, as you may expect. So these, most of them are emails, passwords, credit uh, uh, card data, that kind of data. Okay, and if you want to check if your email has been compromised in a past breach, which is most probably it has happened, you can use this service, okay? Anyway, so this is just to get an idea. Say, okay, we talk a lot about the digital economy and what's out there is a huge data lake of data which have been abused and shared for a number of different purposes. Most major purpose in this case, in the River, uh, River City Media case, for example, or on this uh, spam bot onliner case, uh, it's actually about spam, 
okay? Spammer wanted to reach you, and in order to overcome spam filters, they really needed your real um, email account. So let's go back now to Internet of Things. So maybe now you're wondering, what can I do with this wonderful inter Internet of Things technology when I think about cybersecurity? Well, what I can do with uh, Internet of Things, which means uh, distributed networks of connected sensors, is a very nice form of attack, which is called distributed denial of service attack. And you can see a couple of examples. I think some of them pretty famous, like, for example, the Mirai uh, malware, that, uh, uh, and also the, um, the Bricker Bot malware, which is like a new version. Uh, what this malware uh, do is to use unprotected devices, like for example, your router, you know, your router you have, uh, you have uh, got from your internet provider, you got it at home, it was really easy to install, you never changed the password, you know, you were just too busy and anyway, you should be safe. Where it wasn't. So what happened is that most of these devices, or let's say you bought that very nice camera to watch your baby while you were at work because you didn't trust the babysitter, that kind of things. Well, these things are really unsafe. And they can be, can be used to harm somebody else. So you feel like, OK, I'm safe, I'm, I'm OK. Well, your actually baby camera and your router are being used to, for example, stop the website of uh, uh, Craig you know, Brian Krebs, who uh, just, you know, this is uh, what the DDoS attack are about. It's about using the computing powers of many unprotected machines against some target. Like, for example, a security researcher who is just uh, telling not the so nice story about your company or somebody else. And also, what else can we do? We can also target uh, uh, critical infrastructure, like, for example, um, nuclear power plant, and discover that it's actually easy to walk into a nuclear power plant. It's also fairly easy to walk a satellite, because it's a technology that comes from the 80s, and at that time, we were not encrypting too much. You know, we were just few people investing in this area. So anyway, what's the point of all that? There are some lessons we learn from these real cases. Some lessons that come from the logic of economics, like for example, that companies building embedded systems, like for example, digital video recorders or um, routers, don't have neither the expertise to make them secure nor their resources, okay? Not everybody's Google, not everybody is Facebook. Uh, we don't have the money to pay, we have low margin, we cannot invest in to make our staff secure. The more we get connected, we, the more we connect all these devices, the more the vulnerability surface increases, which means there are, there, it's easier to be under attack. <laughs> We lack international law protecting reverse engineering, which means if there is a white hat hacker out there trying to help us undercover our vulnerabilities, these people can be jailed in the US. There are several cases and also uh, all over the world because we don't have laws to protect these people. So, which means that the uh, the vulnerabilities are discovered by the bad people for bad purposes. What can we do? Final slide. Can, we can develop app, like for example, the IoT inspector um, developed at Princeton. It's, uh, an app, it's an application you can download just to give these people data about how your smart devices are collecting data about you. We can issue laws, like for example, the Senate bill uh, uh, is, uh, approved by the California Senate, which is about uh, uh, protecting the broken Internet of Things. We, in Europe, we have GDPR, we have the NIST directive. Most people, I can tell you, in municipality don't know about the NIST directive. What else? This is the question for the, for the audience. Thank you. Stand here. 
Okay. Um, right. I, whenever I come to Europe, and I come back to Europe, I should say, it's always delightful to hear from academics who are working cooperatively in nice municipal environments where it's possible to have participation and so on. It's not the same in North America. And I'm here to tell you that we're in a very different situation. I'm really speaking here today not as an academic, but as an activist, and an activist who's got involved in the Sidewalk Labs controversy in Toronto. And I want to tell you, if you like, it's a bit of a, a personal and political economy of Sidewalk Labs in Toronto. For those of you who don't know what Sidewalk Labs is, the first thing is the what. You know, the what, the who, and the what are they doing, I couldn't question. Sidewalk Labs is an alphabet company, i.e. it's a Google subsidiary. Back in about, I can't remember when it was, 2012 or 13, Larry Page made a remark in a speech, Larry Page of Google, that we should have places in the world which, where we can experiment in real life, in real time. And every thought, you know, all the, all the tech bros who love this stuff are like, yeah, fantastic, we should have real experimental sites. Sidewalk Labs was essentially set up to conduct real world experiments in real cities. It's done so in various ways in New York, and some of you will be also very much aware of this if you're in Britain, with these link terminals that are set up by sidewalk subsidiaries that are very, very offensively large, advertising-dominated wireless terminals that are being posted in cities around the world. A basic surveillance data collection devices that are designed to sweep up your data if you dare to actually use the wireless services that these provide. <coughs> but their biggest and most ambitious project so far is building an actual community in Toronto. Now, one of the things, if anybody follows me on Twitter, it's at Murakami Wood, you will know that one of the things I say most frequently is beware of corporations bearing gifts. And I think in the smart city world, this is one of the most important lessons. A lot of the stuff that is out there, especially for cities which are suffering in the climate of austerity and neoliberal rollback of funding for local governments, which is the case in many parts of the world, the idea that you can actually be given stuff to solve your problems is an incredibly tempting prospect. And so here comes Sidewalk Labs coming to the city of Toronto and saying, we'll build you, we want, we'll build you a, a smart city for free in Toronto, essentially. Actually, it turns out not to be free. And one of the many questions you need to ask when you are confronted with a corporation bearing gifts is what's the real price? Who's benefiting and what's the real cost here? And we're slowly discovering in Toronto what the real cost is. Before I go there, I want to say who Sidewalk Labs is. It's not enough to explain Sidewalk Labs as being a subsidiary of, of Alphabet. You've got to look at who is actually involved in this corporation and how it came to be. The CEO is a guy called Dan Doktorov. He's a personal friend of Larry Page. And essentially, Sidewalk Labs was set up as a kind of make-work project for underemployed ex-employees of the Bloomberg administration in New York. Many of its senior people are ex-Bloomberg staffers, um, and have worked for the Bloomberg Corporation and moved across to be in the mayor's office or be an officer of the city of New York when he was mayor. And it's essentially a kind of you know, favor by Larry Page to his friend and his cronies to allow them to have $2, million, $2 billion or whatever to play around with and to make smart cities. Sidewalk Labs has absolutely no credible city making and city building experience. I went to an event a couple of years ago now then when Dan Doktorov spoke to employees of RBC, a major bank in Canada. It's interesting they chose that venue to begin with and who they were talking to. Enthusiastic young bank employees who all thought this was absolutely fantastic. He made a number of interesting remarks there. One of which, which made me laugh, was he started off by saying, Sidewalk Labs, at Sidewalk Labs we've been, this, we've been studying the problems of cities for two years. And everybody was like, oh, that's amazing, wow, two years. I mean, remember, these are people for whom, you know, spending a week on a research project for a memo to a boss is a long time. And the academics in the audience, I was the only person in the audience who laughed at this. I thought it was a joke. No, he was serious. He meant they've been spending two years, it's a long time to be studying the problems of cities, and therefore they must have solved them in this time, clearly. And this is exactly what they're trying to say. They have solved the problems of cities in two years. And now they're going to go out and tell you how cities should be. And so what they're presenting to Toronto is a, is a package a fait accompli. It's a set of services, products, buildings, systems, all of which will be put into place. And while there can be participation, it is going to be on their terms. And it's really interesting to see as a lesson how they are conducting the process of participation even before we start having anything in place. There is nothing there, by the way, yet. This is only a notional smart city at the moment. 
The land is an empty piece of quayside waterfront land. It's owned by a, a very strange corporation called Waterfront Toronto that's a quasi-governmental organization, which in itself is a strange set of politics, which I can't go into today. And there's nothing there. They have a series of pictures. They don't even have proper plans that have been made available to the public. There are just pictures. And there are words. So how do they conduct their participatory um, cons consultations? Well, they've had several of them so far, and the general format is Sidewalk Labs employees stand up and tell us what, how it's going to be. And then there is time for questions. And when you ask a question, they defer to the lawyer who stands up and says, well, you know, this is a very difficult question to answer, and of course there's legal implications and we can't talk about those. Um, and I got so frustrated at the first um, consultation, me being the kind of person I am, I literally stood up and shouted, answer the question! I actually was on a, I almost, almost swore as well, but you can't do that in Canada. <laughs> in fact, usually you can't even stand up and shout at people in Canada. This is really, really, really difficult. Um, but people were surprised, but everybody was thinking that, right? The, the lawyers were just not answering the question. So this is the nature of the consultation that's been offered to the City of Toronto. It's essentially, take it or leave it. Every time there is a critique, and we've, there's a number of people who have been developing ongoing critiques of Cyborg Labs in a really interesting way, and I'll give, put the website up afterwards of the little organization that we've set up, which is called the Toronto Open Smart Cities Forum, which is designed to create different ways of doing smart cities in Toronto and different conversations. And there's a number of people I should credit here, because I'm really reporting on their behalf. Bianca Wiley, Nazma Ahmed, Nabil Ahmed, um, and Molly Soto, and amongst others, who are really involved in producing these critical accounts. Marina Valverde, too, from the University of Toronto. And Brenda McPhail, also from Toronto. A number of people are producing critiques. The way that Sidewalk responds to these critiques is very interesting, because it kind of, like some kind of Borg-like entity, absorbs them and makes them part of its collective. So if you, for example, Bianca Wiley wrote a very interesting piece about civic data trusts and how we could indeed control data in this environment. Because I mentioned what the price of Sidewalk Labs is. Their price is essentially all of our data. Anybody who has anything to do with this project, who lives there, who goes there, all your data will belong to us, essentially, to, to Sidewalk Labs. And they've made it very clear that this data will not be housed in Canada. It will be in the USA in the beginning and that there will be no intellectual property accruing to anyone else apart from Sidewalk Labs. And by the way, the intellectual property piece is really important here, because essentially, remember, this is an urban experiment. They are doing this not to provide a nice living environment for people in Toronto, but to see what they can develop using those people in order to sell in terms of more kinds of products in various ways for Google and Sidewalk Labs and other subsidiaries. So there's going to be a lot of IP generated here off the backs of the exhaust data, two minutes, um, that, that will be produced. This is, of course, the model of surveillance capitalism we were talking about last night in Shoshana Zuboff's book launch. This is what Google has pioneered. However, every time there's a critique, they absorb the critique. So when the Bianca Wiley suggested, no, this is not the way we should manage data, we should have a civic data trust that would enable people to control how data is used in this environment. Google immediately, literally a day or two afterwards, produced a document saying, yes, we're going to implement a civic data trust. But then everybody's like, hooray, we've succeeded. Then you look at the detail, and it's like, it's not quite what you imagined it was going to be. It's not about people controlling the data. It would basically create a data clearinghouse for other corporations to be allowed certain access to the data. Not a civic data trust at all, in other words. And continuously, this process happens. There's a critique, there's a response. It looks superficially like the critique has been addressed, but actually not at all. The problem is that so many people are willing to accept almost anything to have high-tech development in Toronto that they will not actually be bothered by any of the criticisms. Cyborg Labs almost doesn't need its own PR because there are so many people in Toronto prepared to promote this and just say, wow, this looks so cool, it's so great, I want to live here. Who is going to live in this place? Again, at the same talk, I went to um, that, yep, that uh, Dan Doktorov gave a few couple of years ago there was, a, in response to a question, Dan Dogtroff made a kind of comic aside, and he said, like, well, it won't all be tech bros. Ha, ha, ha. To which I immediately thought, it will be tech bros. He's promised now that there will be, I think, a small amount of the housing will be under average market price in Toronto. That sounds great until you realize that the average market price in Toronto for, for you know, apartments is absolutely astronomical. It's the second most expensive city in North America after Vancouver. And it may surprise you that 
throughout Canada is so expensive compared to other places. There's an absolute property boom. So again, he's not offering housing, of social housing or housing for poor people here. So yes, it will all be tech bros. What I want you to, to realize for the next couple of years as the Cyborg Labs' plans progress here is to keep watching. This is one of the most important, I think, test cases for how corporate imposed smart cities are going to work in the world. And I think unless we watch this very carefully, unless we respond very strongly, this is a case that will allow, will set a precedent across the world. Um, and so Toronto, in some ways, we're in a terrible position of responsibility here. We can't just do what Berliners did and say, fuck off Google. By the way, that's the title of their campaign. I'm not being rude here. That was literally the title of their campaign. Um, we can't do that in Toronto, right? Not least because Canadians never say fuck. But um, it's, it's just not the Canadian way, right? There's a different kind of politics. And partly, as Sidewalk Labs coming from New York, it's a much more rough and tumble organization. They don't care for Canadian niceties. They will bulldoze over people because that's how you do it from New York. So we've got to fight and we've got to learn different tactics and we've got to basically ask for your help from around the world for how we can confront this Goliath that's coming to uh, swallow us all. Thank you. All right, fantastic. So we had five speakers and I'm sure there are Quite a few questions. If, um, if you mind, uh, if, when, if you raise your hand, if you have questions right now, otherwise I will proceed. Please. I was going to come to the front. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. So Andrew Adams, Major University. Um, partly for David, but if anyone else wants wants to weigh in on this as well, um, I've seen a lot of. Um, similar proposals to Cyborg Labs coming out of China. Um, mm -hmm. And this is of grave concern to me that not only do we have the Western corporatism coming into this area, we've got the Chinese authoritarianism coming into this area in uh, a big way. Are there, is there any hope that, or are we just going to have the choice between Google and the Chinese Communist Party? What, what could we do, other than resisting on this, to try and create a better way forward? I guess since I'm here, I'll answer the question. But, um, um, yeah, I think there's multiple models for how smart cities can work, and I'm sure our other panelists will have different suggestions for this. But those are certainly two of the models. There's a kind of thing I call surveillance empire in the work I'm doing, which is the Chinese model. Um, and then there's the kind of the corporate platform surveillance model, which is you know, the model I think attributes to Google. They're not the only options, so sometimes it seems that those are the two options we're being presented with. I think many of our panelists are coming from a different European model, you like, which is a co more participatory and cooperative model. So I'll let them say you know, what kinds of options, other options they think there are. Yeah, that's great. So please, I also want to urge uh, William, because you also had, you talked about three approaches in your first talk. So maybe you can start with, with maybe addressing this question from, from that perspective, and then we can take the, the other examples that we saw. Okay. <coughs> okay, so I think what we've observed in our research is that there are a number of different perspectives around smart cities. There's no two smart city that's the same. They incorporate lots of different smart city technologies. They implement them differently. They have different approaches. And so these different models, the... Uh, the China model, the, the Toronto model. There's no two smart cities that have, has kind of implemented the, the smart city technologies in the same way. And actually what we've found is that there are quite subtle, local, nuanced differences in the way that institutions function, which heavily shape the way that the smart city rolls out. So for example, um, Glasgow uh, traditionally is seen as quite a top-down municipality, lots of centralised control, very much driving the smart city agenda around uh, an award that they won uh, five years ago. Um, in Brazil, or maybe surprisingly, they have much more bottom-up approach to smart city, where the different technologies are selected and evolved, are coming from communities um, and NGOs and other agencies, maybe because they haven't got the centralised resources and the centralised control in that particular munis municipality. So whilst I can, you can clearly see some bigger picture developments around global smart city developments, I think what our research is showing is that actually the local context also shapes considerably the way that the technologies are evolved and deployed. 
I want, I want just to remind ourselves that the smart city market is a business-to-business -business market. This is something we tend to forget, I, I guess, especially uh, at European level. Okay, <laughs> so which means, in practical terms, that uh, users are not part of the picture, and that's why we don't see citizens actually engaging and engaged into smart city project, we, because uh, citizens are not the customers. Okay, it's not social media. Uh, when uh, we talk about the distinction between uh, Western corporate world and China, the only meaningful distinction, because it's still capitalism, uh, it's about public procurement. China is a diff has a different public procurement model, okay? S to some extent, a more effective one, because they are able to invest in a, uh, on, a, on the base of a larger time frame, so they are still making uh, five, ten years investments. So when, when they think about infrastructure and they're paying, because the state is paying, they truly think about infrastructures. Okay, and the security and the safety of those infrastructures. And that's why they are building their own hardware, which is something in Europe we're not doing it. We are buying hardware from one way. So these are just give you some glimpses. So do you have additional Well, um, in the Netherlands, which is uh, traditionally a country where uh, multi-stakeholder approaches are favored, um, we see now that these smart city concepts play out differently. For instance, take the city of Eindhoven, which monitored uh, a, a, a district where people go out at night and uh, uh, have drinks. And that was very much done top down in cooperation with companies without consultation of the people going into that area. And no one is notified that your picture is taken while you're uh, having a good time in that area. And other cities, um, for instance, the city of Utrecht, are very well aware that in their council is a liberal party that is quite strong and might raise crit critical questions. So those local differences shape the approach in uh, working with the technology. Um, but but um, just to, to add to what David said, I'm surprised that this iconic idea of the smart city and there has none built yet. Uh, Zongdo business district is always hailed as a smart city, but if you read recent blog entries of people actually visiting the city, you see it's not a city. Mm, I wonder why this, this iconic smart city approach is still alive as it is so obvious that it's actually about the depolitization of the urban area and replacing it, replacing the city with something that is merely um, facility management. And I wonder, which city manager, which politician would let his, reduce his job to mere facility management? <laughs> oh, I just could add maybe um, just um, an impression from the Berlin situation because there it's also uh, locally special because there the fear, at least amongst not only uh, public authorities but also uh, private companies, the fear of a sh huge shitstorm that somebody builds up a surveillance system is so high that everybody talks a little bit about it, but actually nobody is doing anything uh, except some things like on the Südkreuzer, uh, etc. And th this puts us scientists a little bit in the comfortable situation, really sitting there on a whiteboard and thinking freely about <coughs> is this, could this be possible in a way, or do doesn't it work? So, yeah. Just to come back finally, I mean, I didn't mention much about the local governance context in Toronto, but basically all levels of government are completely behind this project. In fact, to the point of being so uncritical it's not even worth talking about. Justin Trudeau has just been literally cheerleading for sidewalk labs and saying this is the future, we must have it. Um, the, 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 the local municipality has also said this. The only kind of like fly in the ointment is the rather awful provincial government of Doug Ford, who basically doesn't like Toronto. And really, if anything bad happens to Toronto, it's all it's okay with him. So but this is not for good reasons, right? He just wants bad things to happen to Toronto and laughs about it. So that's, that's really not a good basis for <laughs> a proper participatory municipal politics. Okay, thanks. So now we'll, we'll collect three questions. So we have one question in the back, then we have So the first question is for Max. <coughs> Hi, Pat Walsh, um, Privacy Matters. It's a question for Max and, and I guess to David also, particularly in relation to something you said last night at the book launch. So Max, I was particularly interested because I've been reviewing a number of things lately and there are very powerful interests in the smart city 
environment that a number of you have enumerated on. So whether that's device manufacturers, the operating system manufacturers who want to, and David, you mentioned one of them last night, who might want to connect your maps to vehicle traffic management, for example. It might be Waze in, uh, that's used in Brazil and other, other environments. And there's very powerful interest where they want to connect devices to smart infrastructure, uh, your vehicles to smart infrastructure. And Max, you said, look, it's all personal data. Look, we can't anonymize this stuff. And yet, when I review, almost on a daily basis, the practices and the privacy policies of many of these entities that, ha that, are, that have powerful interests invested in doing what David has outlined, they say, don't worry, it's anonymous. Don't worry, it's aggregated. Don't worry, we've de-identified. Don't worry, it doesn't contain PII. All these lovely terms to make us feel comfortable. So if you're saying that it can't be anonymous, and then we think beyond the individual to group risks and group harms, is your work going in that way? And how could it be done then? So, uh, Michael Bernack, Tel Aviv University, more, more of a comment uh, about the importance of naming following Zuboff's comments yesterday. There's nothing smart about smart cities. We should stop using the word smart and find out something else. Uh, smart cities are uh, corporate, as you said, right? It's a, it's a corporate endeavor where people are objectified using data. So that's not a good acronym or whatever, but there's nothing smart. And we've conducted a study on so-called smart cities in Israel. And uh, city administrators uh, confessed time and again that the only reason they use the word smart is because there's a buzz about that. And which city would not like to be smart? What is it, a stupid city, right? So exactly. That's it, thank you. Well, and of course, Tel Aviv won an award for being a smart city, which is like absurd if you've been there. <laughs> Um, thank you. Uh, Charles Robb, University of Edinburgh. Uh, I'd like to ask Max um, a kind of two-part question. One is, I'm very interested in what you said about the Data Governance Board, but I'm not exactly clear how it works. Does it actually, is it a repository of data, or do people bring the data there from different places and they decide on, what is it, the data matching or the data sharing or, or, or what? Just exactly what, get, what happens there. Mm -hmm. The second part of the question is, uh, has there been a data protection impact assessment for the, the Berlin smart city uh, to cover those sorts of, of um, yeah. uh, um, developments? Thank you. Okay, so please maybe Max, you will uh, begin. Uh, maybe I start with the last question. Um, so, um, so of course we tried to um, uh, write such a, a data protection impact assessment. So it wasn't really um, a specific a data protection impact assessment following all the rules of um, Article 35 uh, GDPR, because for that the project was far too unspecific. Um, unspecific. So as we understood Article 35, there must already a specific um, a project with a specific infrastructure so that you can really look, look into the system and then um, yeah, assess the threats and the impact, etc. But what we could do is focusing more on the impact and then on a very early stage and then drawing first conclusions in order to find out, okay, is this too dangerous so that no further discussion makes sense? Or is there the, the, a, a, a thinking possibility to, to look into more detail under these conditions? And this was the uh, outcome now, referring then uh, to this data protection board. And there, uh, the answer is so, at least, I mean, we, 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 we let us inspire by um, all the medical uh, data protection uh, uh, boards, etc. And there, the board itself doesn't own the data. So it doesn't get into contact with the data. So, But there are the, the other entities. And in our case, we would say, OK, the default rule is that each entity collecting data, for example, like this parking lot sensor uh, startup, is only allowed to collect data for exactly deli de delivering its own service. 
nothing less, or uh, uh, the public Wi-Fi system provider only for its uh, uh, specific service. And then in the moment somebody shows up and uh, would like to research something, yeah, because it, it had on, on the whiteboard an idea, then it has to go to the data protection board and pitch this idea and the yeah, it's very, maybe it sounds more bureaucratic than it could be in the <laughs> end when it's standardized, etc. But the idea is that the data protection board then says, okay, under these conditions, uh, combine it uh, for that specific purpose. Uh, and then t um, in order to come to uh, the first question um, uh, from the first, um, um, so regarding the anonymity, I mean this was one of the most fascinating um, um, yeah, uh, results of writing this uh, data protection impact assessment because very often um, if it comes to the question, I mean, it's the very core question whether data is personal or not, or whether data was successfully uh, anonymized. And very often, this is not really um, assessed uh, in a very precise detail. And it was so interesting and stunning f for myself to see, uh, well, actually, it, it's impossible to, to uh, I mean, the whole concept of data protection or, or personal data doesn't really make sense anymore if you get to this um, uh, 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 result. Because then you could also name the law uh, uh, the general data regulation and not data protection. Yeah, yeah. So, because there is no r r reference to, uh, to uh, the personal uh, factor. However, the question then is so, if there is no personal which is not personal, nevertheless, we have to differentiate between different protection uh, uh, measures, um, etc. And this is where we can start the discussion, of course, with companies which try to mislead uh, the, uh, uh, the public, pretending that they have a real functioning um, anonymiza anonymization technology. We will discuss this um, at the panel this afternoon, by the way. I mean, that was one of the things I was going to say in response to this, is that it's not all, it's not all about privacy, and privacy is not enough for any of these things. I mean, there are, there are questions of justice, of fairness, of other kinds of rights that, even if, you, even if you could anonymize every kind of data, would still be there. Because we're talking about the application of policies and the results of data that will discriminate profoundly on different bases. And this brings us finally to the question again of the object and concept of data protection. So is it privacy, is it data, or is it um, fairness in uh, uh, legal trials, um, et cetera? Yeah? Tricky question. Just on the idea of anonymous, um, I can tell you that data can be made anonymous, OK? Uh, it's 2018, and I think even lawyers know that uh, it's better you don't make that claim, okay? Because there have been a number of studies uh, proving that it's really easy to de-anonymize data, okay? And uh, that's the reason why we're moving into the direction of the uh, differential privacy and this idea of... Uh, the, 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 the real issue is what I showed in the other slide, okay? There is too much uh, auxiliary information out there to claim that your data set can be isolated from all other information which is out there. And that's the reason why all information is personal, because there is always uh, some additional information available out there that make your data set a personal data set. And when it comes to uh, smart city, and uh, when it goes to the, for example, smart mobility kind of project, it's especially challenging because there are a number of studies that demonstrate that it's especially difficult to make movements um, anonymous because spatial, spatial temporal data are extremely personal. So. One of the trade-offs when we talk about smart city is this idea that then, because it's public service, we need to create an a open data project, you know, with, uh, b besides our, our smart city project. And this is a serious issue. I mean, New York knows better when they release data on taxi uh, drives across the city. 
it was easy to recognize each taxi medallion, and it was easy to recognize who was, uh, there, there were people just showing where celebrities were going. And there are a number, you know, these are a number of examples of, for example, information from military <laughs> personnel exposed because some people were using fit fitness trackers. So it's like there is too much information, but this is the big data discourse. We need more data, we need all this data to put together all this data, and on the other side, gosh, the more we do it, the worse it, come, it, it becomes. Okay. Can I just um, finally respond to the question of the political well economy? Well, we have two minutes. Okay. Two minutes. But I mean, one, the question of was raised about sort of the more political economy approach, which we haven't talked to here. I mean, one of the things is about who these smart city companies are. They're not just companies like Sidewalk Labs. There's almost every kind of company which used to do every kind of different thing and now a smart city company. So you've got companies that made elevators that are now a smart city company. You've got companies that are electricity companies that are now a smart city company. Component manufacturers who are a smart city company. Everybody is a smart city company now. So it's it's really hard to trace, you know, what you know, anybody who started from anywhere can now be a smart city company and offer you a smart city package. So the the political economy here is very complicated. It's not one kind of company that you can deal with who's come from one kind of tradition. Um, and that also complicates the relationship with, with local government. Just as local government is complicated and individual, many of these companies are very different in how they work and what they can offer. I think that will be the last word of this session. Uh, thank you, the, uh, the panelists, for, for sharing it with us. Um, thank you for the audience.